Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new season of Prime Time at the Bethlehem University Library. Uh, my name is Barry Fisher. I'm the Associate Dean of Arts and Humanities. Uh, Prime Time is a collaborative project between the Friends of the Bethlehem University Library, faculty development, and many other offices on campus, including academic affairs. Uh, it celebrates learning beyond the classroom through the experiences and accomplishments of faculty, faculty students, and staff. If you're interested in looking at some of the past prime time, prime time presentations from the past seasons, they're available on the uh, Bethlehem University Digital Library, which is found on the library's homepage. Looking ahead to the next presentation, uh, Tuesday, October 28th, the guest speaker will be Dr. Matthew Mayhew, who's Associate Professor of Higher Education at New York University. And he'll be presenting his research on the impact of interfaith interaction on students' moral and spiritual development. Dr. Mayhew is working on a project for faculty, uh, along with Bethel professors Marion Larson, Sarah Shady, and Amy Poppinger, uh, regarding integrating interfaith study and experience into their courses. This morning is a special edition of Prime Time, as we are welcoming two Edgar Scholars. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Edgar Scholars program. It supports faculty, student, research teams as they collaborate on a research project. The project must be one that has the potential to make a significant contribution to a given field of study, and it must reflect meaningful collaboration on research between the students and faculty. The Edgren Scholars Program is named after John Alexis Edgren, founder of what is now Bethel University. And one of the key educational principles that Edgren articulated in the 19th century was, quote, the relation between teachers and pupils shall not be that of commander and subject, but one of true friendship and helpfulness. It's in this spirit that we established the Edmund Scholars Program in order to encourage and facilitate students and faculty working together. Today, Professor of Biology, Dr. Jeff Port, and the student collaborator, Chad Saboran, who is an environmental science major, are going to share their research about the, about the relationship between plant diversity and the diversity, abundance, and ecological complexity of insects within different side-by-side -side grassland reconstructions. Their presentation is entitled, Invertebrate Biodiversity in Reconstructed Grasslands. Do bugs really care where they live? Let's welcome them. Thank you, Barrett. I appreciate that, and thank you uh, all for coming. Uh, we look forward to sharing a little bit about uh, some of the things that we've spent this last summer and, in fact, are continuing to do. Uh, and um, just to give you a little idea of what we won't be talking about, our research did not consist of uh, opinion surveys on the part of the bugs to see whether or not they cared whether they lived or not. Uh, but, in fact, uh, we did evaluate uh, where these uh, insects were found based on some uh, vegetation features. That uh, Chad will describe a little bit later on when we talk about this. So we've actually been working at this particular site. Uh, Chad will uh, talk a little bit more about the, the location as we get into the talk. But we've actually been working at this particular site since about 2007. And uh, this particular uh, location, we had the opportunity as a follow-up to some work we did in Wisconsin, had the opportunity to, to set this location up um, as a specific research site. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity. It's down by Austin, Minnesota. Uh, and so it involved, uh, it has involved over the last several years quite a bit of driving back and forth during the summer to get down to Austin, but uh, as you'll see, it's, it's been well worth it. And so we've been doing uh, work with small mammals down there, and we've been doing work with birds down there, songbirds, uh, but this represented the first opportunity to uh, work with some insects, and I've been waiting for several years for just the right opportunity to have the right student to come along who was passionate about working with uh, invertebrates and insects, and so Chad approached me uh, last year about the possibility of doing some work down there, uh, and I said, perfect, this is uh, a great project, uh, and uh, he was excited about working on it. On it. So um, what I'm going to do uh, in, for the next uh, several minutes is just give you a little bit of background of why we're interested uh, in this area, because uh, for a lot of you, you may be sitting there wondering why in the world would anyone care where bugs live. Uh, and so what I want to do is just give you a little bit of background on why we might be uh, interested in this particular question. Uh, and then we'll get into uh, some of the results uh, of the study that we've got so far. 
Frank Lloyd Wright uh, stated at one uh, point in time that if it serves its purpose, it is beautiful. Right? So that raises the question uh, as it relates to uh, reconstructions and, and landscapes uh, of whether or not beauty is in a purpose of itself. Uh, and of course, if we look at something like an English garden, uh, really the purpose of an English garden is to be beautiful, just a, a gorgeous landscape. Um, some of you may be gardeners, and you have your um, beautiful landscaping around your homes and your backyards, whatever it might be, and you appreciate that. We can all appreciate, I think, to a certain level, uh, the beauty of, of, a, of a finely maintained garden. On the other hand, we have something like a vegetable garden. Uh, and while that, in my eye, that is a beautiful garden, um, it, you know, I think it probably pales in comparison to the kind of things. We get lots of tourists that might be interested in seeing this. You probably don't have very many tourists that are interested in visit, visiting a vegetable garden. However, it has a specific purpose, and that purpose is very different than what we see in an English garden. In an English garden, the purpose might simply be to be beautiful, to be relaxing, to be a place where we can uh, spend time. Whereas for a vegetable garden, the purpose is uh, very clearly to provide food. And the beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but, but it's not the primary purpose of that particular location. So yes, English garden's beautiful, vegetable gardens, perhaps, right? But that's not really the purpose of a vegetable garden. So it raises the question then, how does this relate to prairie reconstructions and the question that we're talking about today? And that is, are prairies supposed to do something or can they simply just be beautiful? Okay, so what is the purpose when we talk about prairie reconstructions? What is the purpose of doing a reconstruction? Are we doing it just so that we provide some grassy areas that look nice? Or are we really um, trying to reconstruct areas that serve a function or have a purpose other than beauty? And of course, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have beautiful areas that serve functions as well. And so we, we were interested in the secondary question, and that is, is there a function that is a part of a natural prairie um, that is essential um, uh, to, the, to the operation uh, or the stability of those particular grasslands. Okay. Now, a little bit of background in terms of prairies. Prairies come in many different forms. Um, we have, uh, historically, they were found throughout the middle part of the North American continent, extending all the way, from, as you can see here, from Texas, all the way up through into the, what we call the prairie pothole region uh, in uh, the Midwest and into uh, the southern parts of Canada. And um, what well, you can't see uh, on this slide, but uh, it, you can certainly see the color combinations here. To the east, uh, we had what was called tall grass prairie. This is the classic prairie, if you've read Little House on the Prairie and Laura Ingalls Wilder's books, and they, you know, the descriptions there, or you've seen descriptions um, uh, of, uh, of prairies where the tall grass prairies extended uh, six and seven and up to eight feet tall. Uh, it still boggles my mind to think about a horseback rider riding on through a prairie, uh, literally a seed of grass at that point in time, and all you can see is the head on the person uh, as they move through that tall grass prairie. So it's hard to, for us to picture these things because they're largely gone. We really have no remnants uh, on this scale left, um, but uh, this is what represented tall grass prairie. And these tall grass prairies tended to be relatively diverse biologically uh, may have consisted of a hundred or more different species of plants, so very diverse ecosystems. Um, as we move westward, we got into mixed grass prairie, uh, and then finally as we get to the far west, out into places like uh, western Kansas and eastern Colorado, uh, we have what's called short grass prairie. And it's really moisture, the gradient is moisture driven. So as we have more moisture to the east, we have taller vegetation, as we get to the west, we have less moisture and less vegetation, or less height in terms of vegetation, but equally diverse in many of these areas. And of course today, these areas have been dramatically changed. Uh, we no longer have this extensive uh, span of uh, prairie areas that we once had. And of course, we, I think we all recognize what's happened to those areas. We've converted them into what has turned out to be incredibly rich agricultural land. So today, this area represents one of the most, uh, one of the richest uh, agricultural lands in the world. But the trade-off has been the loss of some of this diversity. Um, at one point in time, tall grass prairie, so just that purplish band uh, that ran through Minnesota would have covered roughly 170 million acres. Uh, incredibly large uh, amount today of that, less than 4% remains, and almost all of it, in terms of the single largest stand, is found down in Kansas uh, in an area called the Flint Hills uh, Reserve, the Flint Hills Eco Region. Um, through, scattered throughout the rest of the range of the tall grass prairie are just simply small little pockets, little remnants that are left. Uh, and many of those remnants, in fact, are relatively small. They do not represent these with large tracks. Uh, and so the reason why that is a concern is because of the organisms, the animals that are associated with those particular areas. As we have lost habitat, we have lost 
uh, the animals that live in those areas. So we've seen dramatic declines in, in uh, mammals associated with them. Bison, of course, would be a, 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 an obvious example. But we've also seen a dramatic decline in a lot of the songbirds that are associated uh, with these particular habitats. And so as we consider, right, the larger question that we don't have time to talk about today is, you know, why care at all, right? Why, why should we be concerned about the fact that we may be losing some of these species? I'm going to operate from the premise that I do care, and we care, uh, and that it, there is value in reconstructing those. And so the question then becomes, if we're going to reconstruct prairies, if we're going to try to restore those areas, what might that look like? Okay? Uh, and so that's, that's where we're headed. Here in Minnesota, this is uh, what we have today. Um, the yellow uh, that you can see here corresponds to what was historically prairie. Uh, and so we're working down here in the austin Albert lee area. Uh, and you can see that at one point in time, that was largely a tall grass prairie. The red dots correspond to the, the tall grass prairie that remains in Minnesota today, uh, according to the DNR. And so that represents less than 1% of the total area that at one point in time was tall grass prairie in Minnesota. So we have a significant reduction in habitat. Uh, throughout our state. Uh, and then if we go down to Mauer County, which is uh, where we have, here's um, Austin itself. Uh, and if we look at Mauer County, uh, what you can see here is the, and the colors aren't coming out extremely well, but basically all of the white is farmland. Right? And if you can't, you can't see it very well because there's not much of it, but the light tan areas are the areas that represent <coughs> grasslands. So there's very little in the way of grasslands, and those of you that have particularly sharp eyes might be able to see this, but you might notice that a lot of these little, the, uh, the, the tan areas actually correspond to bands. And those typically are going to be bands of grass, and those of you that are from farm areas or driven through farm areas recognize this. These are drainage ditches, right? These are just narrow channels that water flows through, and on either side of them there might be bands of grass, or there might be small bands of grass, you know, four to five, six feet extending out on either side of a fence line. Uh, so within Myer County, we have very little in the way of, of grasslands that remain today. And um, so one of the areas that we're working in is an area where we have been able to reconstruct uh, a, a, a series of grasslands. So prairies are supposed to do a number of things. Um, they are supposed to provide habitat for songbirds and other organisms. Uh, so we see things like meadowlarks. Um, I recall when I was uh, in, uh, in graduate school, actually I was working for a, a company that did a lot of work down in the Woodbury area. And some of you are from that particular part of the city. And we were working in, at that point in time, it was a brand new development in Woodbury. And literally across the road, uh, across Radio Drive, there was still farmland uh, that was uh, actively being farmed and a lot, of, uh, a lot of remnant prairie pieces. It was on a regular basis, uh, I would see meadowlarks singing uh, on, the, on the fence posts across the road from me at, at that point in time. And this was about 20 years ago now. Um, over the, the five years that I worked for that particular company, um, I watched the disappearance of metal arts from that particular area as we built more houses and we continue to expand. And of course now if you go down to that area of Woodbury, it's, it's all built up uh, and you won't find any metal arts there at all. And so as we've lost habitat, we've lost some of these species that are grassland specialists. Uh, and that's true throughout the state and throughout much of, of our country. So uh, these areas provide particularly <coughs> habitat, especially for what we call specialists, uh, birds that are, are specialized for living in these kinds of areas. And there are animals as well. They also provide uh, pheasant and game habitat. In fact, that was one of the primary drivers for the site that we're working down in Austin, uh, is we work with Pheasants Forever and other conservation groups uh, that provided the funding to help uh, plant this particular area because they were interested in providing grassland habitat for pheasants. And that's perfectly fine. That is a legitimate uh, um, reason to reconstruct these grasslands. And in fact, the reality is a lot of the money that goes to reconstruction of habitat in the state and in the United States today comes from private conservation groups that may have specific motives, but um, the reality is that those dollars can benefit, right? If we re reconstruct a grassland that benefits pheasants, it can also benefit the small mammals, it can benefit the songbirds, and ultimately it's going to uh, benefit, uh, hopefully, the insects as well. Um, an increase in pollinators uh, and insects that are associated with pro most of you. If you if you get the Star Tribune, for example, you may have read uh, uh, about a month ago there was a series of articles on uh, on the decline of honeybees uh, and the, the important role that that has uh, within our agricultural industry. That's a major challenge for us today: uh, is the decline of these insects and what's behind it, and what are the factors and loss of habitat. All of these things start to play together. And then, of course, there's lots of other critters. Uh, we've spent the last uh, several summers trapping small mammals down in Austin. And in a typical summer, uh, we catch about 600 things that you don't want in your house. Uh, so we'll catch uh, voles, mice, 
uh, the occasional weasel, lots of different things that, that are just part of the, of the habitat, part of the ecosystems that are there. Um, they also provide uh, water quality, uh, protection of water quality, filtration is an important part of prairies. Um, they become a source where carbon is stored, the products of photosynthesis, um, those plants and plant material um, uh, store that carbon. And one of the things that the settlers found uh, is that as they moved west, and of course when we first, if you think about the settlement pattern here in the United States, most of the settlers were not headed to Minnesota, right? They didn't come here in the eight, early 1800s and say, I want to go to Minnesota, which of course didn't exist at that time. It was, I want to go to California, I want to go to the west coast. Um, but eventually they began stopping along the way here, and those that were had a particularly good work ethic decided that they would try to bust open the sod. Uh, that was the original tall grass prairie. And in some cases, they found that the thatch right, and the root matter uh, that was associated with these tall grass prairies extended anywhere from 6 to 20 feet deep. Right? That represented an incredible storage area or incredible source of, of carbon uh, that we're still benefiting from today. Right? One of the reasons why uh, the area that we uh, that is our farmland today is so agriculturally rich is because of that legacy, because of those grasslands that were present there. Right? And then there's all the stuff that we don't know. right? Uh, Scientists can pretend we know a lot, and we do, uh, but there's an awful lot of things that we don't understand about how these systems function. Uh, and so that remains one of the, the driving challenges uh, for those of us that are interested in prairies and in the organisms that live there, is just trying to figure out how do these systems work. Uh, and I think it's one of the uh, one of the things that God has given us, the curiosity and, and, and a desire to learn more about the, na uh, the systems and nature around us. All right, so we have... Uh, it's, it's well established, or at least I'll make the claim that it's well established that prairies have a number of different functions. Uh, and so that leads to the question that if we're going to reconstruct a prairie, or we're missing, we've lost 99% of our prairies, if we're going to reconstruct those prairies, what should they look like? Um, and today, many of our prairie reconstructions are actually small scale. Some of you may have done this in your own backyards or have relatives that do. If you've got an acre, five acres, less than an acre, where you might plant some, some native uh, plants, maybe uh, associated with an industrial complex, right? small areas that represent prairie restorations. Most of them are small scale, and those are important, and collectively they add up. Um, but it still leads to the question of what should we plant, right? What should it look like? Um, there are some government programs that have helped. Uh, some of you may be familiar with these. Waterfall production areas uh, are um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service areas. We have wildlife management areas that are typically managed by the DNR. We have what's called the Conservation Reserve Program, which has provided federal funding for, uh, for pulling, actually the purpose of it is to pull excess agricultural land and highly erodible agricultural land out of production uh, and convert it into uh, grasslands uh, or some kind of a cover crop for, for, the, uh, for at least the short term. The challenge with a lot of these programs is that we have typically planted them with seed mixes that tend to be relatively low diversity. So if you remember, a historical prairie may have had 100 or more different types of plants. A typical conservation reserve uh, planting usually only has four to five types of plants. Right? So there's a big difference in the amount of seed that is used, uh, or the diversity of seed that is used in, in reconstructing most of our native or our, our uh, prairie remnants that are like this. All right, so the question remains then, what should a restoration look like? And part of the issue is really an economic one, okay? Part of the problem is that when you talk about restoring a prairie with high diversity native seeds, it's expensive. Um, things uh, like, uh, for example, blue gentian, white gentian, other native plants, first of all, they have to be collected by hand. Our mechanized agricultural system works really great for monocultures, for things like uh, soybeans, we can go in there and combine them. For corn, we can go in there and combine them. We can cover thousands of acres within a relatively short period of time. Within a diverse prairie, you have this mixture of different things, right? It's like your vegetable garden where you've got a row of green beans and you've got a row of onions and you've got some tomatoes and you can't just go through with a big machine and harvest all of it. So you have to go in and hand collect. And a lot of these seeds are tiny, they're literally microscopic. And so you're hand collecting these and sorting them. So that means that from a human capital standpoint, it's an expensive process. And so it costs a lot. Some of these seeds can run hundreds of dollars per pound of seed. And if you're planting a pound uh, or more in an acre, you know, it add, and you're doing that for 40 or 50 different types of seeds, that adds up. It becomes very expensive. So it raises the question then, and the question that part of what we're interested in is, is it worth it, right? Is there value uh, in spending all of that money to reconstruct a prairie that is more similar to a remnant prairie or a, a native prairie, or can we effectively get away 
with something that is less diverse, right? Can we accomplish the same ecological purposes, the functions that I was mentioning earlier, by simply planting a half a dozen seed types, half a dozen different plant types? So that was that's really the, the underlying question that, that, that drove the start of this project. Can we really justify the expense from an ecological standpoint? Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we did uh, we had an earlier study over in Somerset, Wisconsin, similar uh, site. Uh, and did some work over there. This is what it looks like, right? We actually had, had uh, set up a number of patches. So there are areas that are uh, low diversity seed mixes, areas that are high diversity seed mixes, and they're side by side. And so we, we did some similar kind of work over there. And some of the things that we learned from this initial site was, first of all, that having this patchwork does increase structural diversity, right? So we have things that are short, we have things that are tall, it turns out that matters, right? It matters to the organisms that are living there. We also know that it collectively increases animal diversity. We found far more animals of different species in each of these different plots than if we just simply had one large area that was planted in one single type of seed. So that was important as well. Okay? And then we also found, not surprisingly, right, I think most of us would probably go in this direction, but it's, it's, it's always good to get confirmation of this, that animals have preferences for particular areas in which they live. And so we may have an area that is set up for, or, or there's a low diversity seed mix, but there are certain types of animals that like to live in those areas. And the same is true for animals that have a preference for high diversity seed mixes. Okay? Not everybody, from an animal standpoint, not everybody likes to live in the same area. Okay? So having a patchwork, a mosaic, may turn out to be the best strategy when it comes to reconstructing these, these sites. All right, I'm going to turn things over to Chad who's been waiting patiently for his opportunity to share a little bit about, and he's going to tell you a little bit about um, where we actually worked, and then also uh, tell you a little bit about uh, some of the kinds of things that we found, because they're, they're pretty cool and pretty exciting. Yeah, so now getting into kind of the specific site that we were working at over the summer. Um, the Schottler Wildlife Management Area is a site that's been, been designated by the Minnesota DNR as a wildlife management area. And, and uh, originally was uh, was farm field, uh, the entire a lot, and it was donated to the state um, about 10, 10 or so years ago, um, and then the reconstruction back to Native Prairie uh, started in 2005, and as Dr. Port pointed out, he's, he's been doing studies at this particular site um, since 2007, so a number of years now, um, and, and basically the way it's been, uh, so the way it was uh, laid out when it was reconstructed was in these, these different plot types. Um, and so F stands for forbs, or TM is tall forbs, and we have warm season grasses, cool season grasses, and those are the focus on the particular uh, plant types within those various plots. And so why this is important for research purposes, and basically we can, we can look at this and see, uh, and what Dr. Port's done with his studies so far in the past, uh, we can see um, what are the differences between what you, what birds you observe there, what small mammals he's collected there, you can compare it between um, the species, plant species present and the plant diversity, um, and compare it across um, these various plant or plot types. Um, and so this is also valuable in looking at the insect world, as, um, as we thought um, in the beginning, um, and kind of formulating um, our plans for the study. Um, and so uh, right here, um, you can see a good representation of kind of the, uh, the boundaries between two different plot types. Um, and then you can see back here, again, well this, this photo was taken a number of years ago. And since then, the plots have, um, over time, they've kind of more kind of combined together a little bit. And the, the boundaries aren't as, as clear and distinct as they, as they once were, which I found, found out originally going down there. I had to kind of learn exactly you know, which plot am I in right now uh, and kind of learn the distinction of those boundaries, which are pretty fuzzy. But, but still, we do have designated plot types. Um, so basically, the specific questions that we were looking for in our study um, is, will we find a difference in both the insect biodiversity and the abundance um, throughout the various plot reconstruction types? And so we, uh, um, yeah, so, what we also wanted to look at was the importance of is there a difference in basically the trophic complexity? Or in other words, is there, is there a difference in the types of ecological roles that um, each of these insects fill? 
um, over these, these different plots? And is there a difference basically in where they fit in the ecosystem and what, how specifically they contribute to the, to the ecological system there and uh, what they feed on, what feeds on them, what plants they prefer. And so that was something that, that we thought would be very beneficial to study in a, in a site like this that has designated plot types with various plant species and uh, various plant dominances. I was just going to point out this is a this is a this is a photo that I took under the microscope. This is I thought it was kind of cool because um, it actually turned out okay. This is just one of the one of thousands of insects. This is a particular bee species that I was able to get a good shot of. So kind of a good snapshot of, of what I looked at for hours on end throughout the summer. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, of course is is a legitimate question to ask is why study insects. Uh, and so, uh, just uh, kind of a quick summary of that before Chad goes into some of the specific results. Um, first of all, they're just they're cool, right? I mean, now you have to have a specific mindset or bent. Um, and if you have them in your house uh, at this time of the year, um, when the box elder bugs are all coming inside, you may not agree with that. But there are some really cool. And, and I mean, it was it was fairly common as Chad and I were analyzing insects, uh, looking at them underneath the microscope, where we look we find one there and they go, wow, this is really cool. You gotta check this out. And we'd swap microscopes and we'd look at them. And you know, so there's just a basic appreciation for that that, uh, that made it worthwhile and made it exciting. Um, from a practical standpoint, they're towards the bottom of the food chain. So when Chad mentioned trophic complexity and ecological roles, insects are towards the bottom of the food chain in most cases. And so that means that lots of other things are eating them. So if we're interested in knowing whether or not there are preferences of songbirds or small mammals, for living in these particular areas, it's helpful to understand a little bit about the types of insects that might be present there, because that may, in fact, be part of the determining factor uh, for uh, other, especially birds during the breeding season that are feeding primarily on insects. They don't move around as much as larger animals, right? A bird within, even though we're working in an area that's roughly 160 acres, a bird can move from one side to the other within a matter of seconds. Uh, an insect, especially in the younger stages, the instar, what we call instars, the earlier stages, um, are typically flightless they're not going to move more than a few feet uh, at any one time and maybe even over the course of their life. So where they're born is going to tell us and where we find them is going to tell us something important about um, the value, ecological value of that particular plot type. Uh, and then they also reproduce quickly, right? So a bird may produce uh, you know, a handful of young, <coughs> a small mammal, something like a vole might produce 20 or 30 young during the course of the year, and an insect can produce hundreds uh, or even thousands over the course of the year. So these are all reasons why um, we chose insects uh, to work uh, and to really sort of continue this investigation. All right, so now I'm moving into kind of our specific methods for the collection. Um, so what we did each month, we had collection periods in June, July, and August. And so what we did in each of the plots for each month, we set five of the pitfall traps, which are represented right here. You can see it's, it's kind of a trap that's set into the ground. And what I did was I poked holes around the sides of each of these cups, which allows insects to, um, as they're walking across the ground, um, basically, it's basically it. they just fall into the pit and get stuck there in the soap solution that um, preserves them for the, for the time being. And, uh, and so these were set um, over a 24-hour period, so I set them one day and then went back and collected them the next day. Um, these basically focus on more so on ground dwell dwelling species. So what our, our uh, idea was to kind of try to spread out these sampling methods to kind of en encapsulate as many um, various um, areas of, of insects that are different areas of ecological niches, basically, um, that we could. So we had pitfall traps, and then another one here, the pan traps, and these focus more on um, fly, flying insects that would be attracted to brightly colored, colored flowers. Um, so we had bright blue plates, and then we also had bright yellow plates, and so these were set up on, on a stake. Um, fairly simple design for these traps, but uh, rather effective as well, and so we set them up approximately a meter above the ground, and uh, also had the same soap solution, so insects that um, they're, they get attracted to the brightly colored objects, and so they fly in there. Um, and so our goal here was to try to focus on, see if we could collect a higher number of pollinators and those types with these specific traps. And in addition to that, what we had was sweep nets and basically your standard butterfly net with the 
very fine mesh because a lot of these insects are very tiny. Um, and so what we did was walk for each plot, walk two transects, and uh, just go along and, and swept, um, basically trying to gather as much as we possibly can within those sweeps, and did 100 sweeps per walk um, within, each, within each plot, <coughs> twice for those ones. Um, but this was not the extent of our data collection, our data analysis, by any means. Um, as I mentioned, we, we went down once per month for one, one sampling or collection session each month. Um, but the majority of the time was spent in the lab, um, so we had to take each of these samples back to the lab and analyze all of them under the microscope. And we um, accumulated a total of 48 samples from the, from the sweep method, um, and then 24 from both the pan and the pit. So there's just under 100 total samples that we went through. We counted a total of over 25,000 insects, which was <laughs> definitely a lot to, to go through individually um, under the microscope. And for each of them, we, we identified, or for the majority of them, we were able to identify down to the family or subfamily um, classification. And so it was, as you can maybe expect, this was kind of quite a long um, process. And I mean, it took basically the whole summer to go through these and even into uh, the beginning of the school year a little bit. Um, so it was, it was kind, of, yeah, it's kind of an extensive process. And this kind of just a small snapshot, this is just I mean, you can see how, uh, how diverse and abundant this, this is just a petri dish. Um, and this is just a portion of, of one of the sweep samples. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, a lot of these insects in here are very small, not, not so easy to, to identify and key out, um, which, is, which is why we had to go through and look at each individual <coughs> family under the microscope. Um, and so, uh, and so, and so the ones. I went through and identified all the families of all the individuals and counted the number of individuals per family. What I did then was go back and um, individually research each of these families and identify the specific trophic role um, that it fits into. And basically, how does this fit into the ecological system? What does it feed on? So, example, classified them as herbivores. Predators, pollinators, frugivores, those sorts of things. So, um, what this might look like to you is a bunch of numbers, which is which is also true. Um, but what I have here is I calculated Shannon Weiner indices. And if you're unfamiliar with the Shannon Weiner index, it's essentially a measure of the biodiversity, um, biodiversity and abundance of each of the family or overall for the families and calculated that for each of the, the plot types, each of the replicates, and then separated them out by collection method as well. So I had um, pit, pit, pan, and sweep, and then uh, one for each of the plots. So uh, as you um, can see here, um, the numbers largely look very similar. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I would, thought it was interesting that there, there really doesn't seem to be too much in terms of differences between the, uh, the diversities specifically over the, over the plot types. Uh, the one that we did note, me and Dr. Port kind of noticed that for the pitfalls at least, it looked like uh, the forbs and the tall forbs um, show somewhat similarity um, between the two different plots, between the replicates of the same plot type. Um, similarity here and then similarity here, which differ from each other. Um, and we were curious to see if, if there actually is a statistical difference. Um, so I, I went ahead and ran ANOVAs for, for each of these sampling methods, and they, were, they all uh, proved to be statistically insignificant in terms of the differences between the, uh, between the plot types. Uh, and then, so, what I did here, um, I took the average number of individuals over each of the plot types and group them according to the collection method. And so, so each, each of the bars would represent um, an average number of individuals for that plot over the three collection periods. And then group them together. And as you can see, at least for the pan and the pit, there didn't, there's not very much variation 
in the, the average number of individuals per flock, um, and um, around around a little under 200, the pit being around 100 individuals per flock. Um, but then I thought it was interesting in the sweep we saw quite a bit of variation in the amount of individuals that were collected per flock, um, and so. What I wanted to see there, again, is there a statistical difference in the, in the amount of individuals? And so I ran an ANOVA on this. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't put the p value <coughs> on it, but it, was, it ended up being 0.052, which if you're, if you're familiar with statistical analysis of, of this nature, can be a little bit disappointing coming with a, up with a value that's that, that close to being significant, but um, just a little bit off of the, the benchmark. Um, so what we what I saw here was the they're not statistically different. Um, however, it, it may show some suggestion that it's approaching that. <coughs> and so what I did next was I uh, separated them out by the average number of families per plot, and then again grouped them by the collection methods. And again, kind of a similar trend. Um, the pan traps um, showed similar number of families per, per plot, and then pits as well. Um, and then for the sweeps, again, um, see a little bit of variation, and so I, I thought there, there may be statistical difference here, so I ran another, another ANOVA, and this time found the, the difference to be, or the p-value in the ANOVA um, was 0.046. And so I did indeed find that there is a statistical difference in the number of families per plot, um, suggesting that um, the tall forbs particularly looks to be higher than the rest. Um, cool season grass looks to be lower. Um, and so even though I haven't been able to identify a difference on the individual level between plots, um, uh, it does look like the, that there is in fact a difference on the family level. Um, and so basically, um, and compare it in, in each of these graphs so far. Um, these are averages over the two different plot um, <coughs> two replicates per plot type. And so what I'm going to do going further here is uh, separate them out on the individual level rather than or, uh, or rather than averaging them, kind of find the cumulative and uh, see if there's any any difference in the in the variation that I can find there. And so, in analyzing the, the trophic rules that I researched per family, um, what I did here was represent, here's the, uh, the different trophic rules that I identified for, for all the families on the bottom. And then the y-axis would be the number of families that, is, um, that represent each of those trophic rules. Um, and as you can see here, um, they, they tend to be very similar. And I ran an ANOVA comparing each of these different trophic rules and you know, a very high p-value, so suggesting that it's, it's really nowhere near um, uh, a difference, at least at the family level, between what you find in each plot uh, in terms of trophic uh, comparisons. Um, um, but again, this was, um, this was based on kind of the averages that I took over the, the individual uh, plots. Um, and then, what I want to do going forward here is again separate it up, um, um, combine the cumulative for all the individuals, and rather than rather than looking at the family level, I want to look at um, the number of total number of individuals um, for each of these trophic roles, because I I think that a lot of a lot of the families, some of them represented a lot higher number of individuals than other families, and so looking at that data, we may indeed find. Um, more specialization per plot for some of these particular trophic levels, and so that'll be uh, the next the next analysis, basically from here. Uh, so basically, uh, what we can glean from this is we've seen a few differences, basically in the Shannon Weiner diversity index um, between the plots. Um, however, as I mentioned, I still have to go back and I'm, I'm going to look at the individual level um, and a cumulative of those uh, to see if maybe we can come up with a little bit more variation there. Um, and then also 
little difference from the last graph, a little difference in the trophic complexity uh, between the plots at the family level. And uh, I want to emphasize, again, family level here because I haven't yet separated out for individuals for trophic level. Um, so, uh, yeah, so basically similar pattern in terms of, in terms of that but also similar patterns <coughs> overall, which we thought was kind of interesting, that uh, <coughs> certain uh, trophic levels were yeah. a lot more abundant than other ones, for instance, in the same plots. Um, so this suggest or, uh, there was a suggestion that the tall Forbes plots, the, the bar graphs that I showed you earlier, um, had a higher abundance of organisms, as that one was, uh, that one showed to be close uh, approaching, but not quite at the le level of statistical significance. And then for the number of families, it showed that there lo it looked like there was indeed a difference in the, at the diversity of family levels, or the abundance of each family. Um, and this, well, this was apparent in the sweep sample sets, which is kind of interesting that we had that in the sweeps, um, but really didn't see much of a difference at all in the pitfall or, or pan sampling methods. Um, so this, what this suggests is, even though we didn't see a whole lot of difference um, at the, in terms of the families that I identified, um, there could very well, if we were to further identify them down at the species level, that could produce um, a, little bit, a little bit deeper understanding of um, each of these individual roles. Um, a lot of the families, and when researching their ecological and their trophic roles, um, so, some of them were quite broad, and uh, and some of them showed that there was actually multiple categories that are represented within those families. So, um, if we were to go ahead and research it down to the species level, which would be quite a, comp quite a complicated uh, research um, job, but that that could potentially prove to be a little bit more significant. Um, at that level, we would be more precise with our ecological understanding of, of the individuals overall. Uh, so basically, uh, the answer still is unclear um, from what I've kind of gone over so far. A lot of IP values, a lot of uh, data has proved to be not really conclusive to showing significance at this point. Um, and we'll see what else I can pull out of that as I continue and move it um, down to individual cumulative level for a plot study. Um, and we have to, basically, what I've mentioned, we have to continue with the analysis. And there's a lot, a lot left to, to kind of plug into the equations and a lot left that still needs to be looked at and refined as well. So yeah, just kind of pulling it all together here as we uh, wrap up, and I know we're running a couple of minutes long, but um, if we if we pull together some of the work that Chad's done with some of the work that we've been doing at this site and other sites, uh, it, it does suggest that um, we're not seeing differences at the family level that are major differences, but um, with the small mammals and the birds, we are seeing some differences at the species level. Um, and the challenge, and, and of course some of you may be asking, well, why did you do it at the family level and not at the species level? For those of you that uh, don't know, identifying insects, even to the family level, uh, involves looking at things like um, vein patterns on wings. Right? So the difference between one family and another is uh, at the microscopic level, it's a branching pattern. Right? It's missing a vein, or it has extra vein, or you know, branches on this side, or it might be the number of hairs on the third segment of the foreleg. So that's the family level identification that we did. And when you start to get down into genus and species level identification, it gets even worse. So that's why we, we chose to do this analysis at the family level and the subfamily level. Um, and I was telling Chad the other day that if he decides that he wants to pursue this at the species level, he's just selected for himself a graduate level project because that's really what it would entail. Uh, so even the level of work that he did this summer uh, is, a, is a very impressive uh, body of work given the, the level of knowledge that, that is required and that he had to build in order to be able to do this. So we spent a lot of time here in the lab uh, as part of this project. But, uh, so the, sort of the, the, the last take home message here is that 
Um, what all of these little bits of data suggest at this point is that it's probably, if you're thinking about reconstructing a query, it's really about the mosaic, right? It's about finding the diversity of different types of vegetation because that lends itself to these species level uh, preferences. Uh, and, and it's not just a matter of doing what, frankly, our practice has been, and that is practicing or planting you know, hundreds of acres of effectively what are modern cultures, right? big blue stem, switchgrass, a couple of different species, and we're missing out on opportunities to, to replant areas that can serve not just you know, pheasants, uh, but can serve uh, this whole host of non-game species that are critically important ultimately to the survival of the pheasants themselves. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Uh, sorry for running a couple of minutes long. Thanks to the Edmund Scholars Program and to Bethel University for funding this research. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without uh, uh, the support from the program. Um, and then also, uh, we appreciate being able to collaborate with the DNR on this particular site. So it's, uh, it's an opportunity to do that in really a unique place to work, which makes the two-hour drive back and forth to Austin uh, on a regular basis also a lot worth it. I know we don't have very much time. We're happy to stick around and, and answer questions if you have. Um, but thank you very much again for coming. Refreshment. So if you have yeah, if you have questions, ask or or come on up.